All right. So, gases. So, we're going to kind of go through a lot of things in this one. We're going to start sort of conceptually and then walk into the calculations. But by the end of the, this quarter, the thing that we need to be able to do is we need to know very both conceptually, you guys have figured out I like those questions, along with calculating how volume, pressure, and temperature are all related to each other. You're going to know a lot of this already, especially once I point it out to you, which I, I realize is you know, a little bit of an oxymoron. But you'll, you'll realize that you know a lot of it already, at least conceptually. And we'll actually put that into equation form probably today, if not today, next class. So we're going to learn about how the ideal law, or the ideal gas law, that you kind of have an idea about how things work in real life how that's going to be related to if you have one ideal gas or if you have a bunch of different mixtures of ideal gases and how you can kind of calculate really complicated problems with lots of different gases all together just by breaking them down into a whole bunch of simple problems. Um, then what we're going to do is after we, we're starting with sort of bulk properties, we're starting with these big, you know, liters, two liters of gases, and we're just talking about them in terms of pressure, volume, temperature, moles, things of that sort. Once we learn that, we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to actually look at the kinetics of it and see really qualitatively. Kinetics really isn't until um, 1C, but we'll get an idea of how the actual way that the atoms are moving around is giving you those bulk properties, the, the pressure and the volume, and why things that the atoms are doing are making those properties be like they are. And that's called kinetic molecular theory. So we'll get into that near the end. Um, and then, you know, as standard in chemistry, we're going to tell you a bunch of things that almost work, and then we're going to tell you why we lied to you a little bit. You're, you're getting the pattern there, I think. So we, we're pretty much going to spend 95% of the chapter on what we call ideal gases that we'll get into. But real gases aren't going to be ideal. And so we'll show you one of the ways that you can sort of make up for this and fix issues with not being quite ideal. And then um, there's lots of actual ways to do this, but we're just going to pick the one that's used the most, and we're going to walk through that. So that'll be sort of the last 5% of the chapter. OK. First, what is a gas? So you know, kind of going, going back, we talk about solids, we talk about liquids, we talk about gases, right? Those are sort of our three main phases that we talk about. Um, the idea with gases that's different from all the rest is that they're moving freely, right? They aren't necessarily near each other. Um, depending on the pressure, they may be farther or closer to each other. But in general, they're just moving freely. It's not like a liquid where they're all sitting on top of each other just rotating around. Or like a solid, which you can think of as like a, a tight lattice. Like we filled up all the chairs in here. And you know, you guys would be sort of a solid lattice. Yeah? Oh, it'll be, yeah, actually I meant to say that. So she asked the, the final for the sake of studying, so you know, it'll be 25% midterm one, 25% midterm two, and 50% chapter four. Okay. Sounded like you guys were surprised. I'm not sure why, but <laughs> I guess it was a good thing to talk about. Okay. So unlike liquids and solids, they aren't going to be touching each other most of the time. When they are, it's going to be sort of a quick thing, right? They're going to t bounce off each other and move their own, own way. They're not really going to be interacting with each other at all, or at least not much. Now, this gives gases some properties that liquids and solids don't have. If you try to take a solid, um, like a real solid that doesn't have a bunch of air pockets in it, and you try to compress it, you're not really going to be able to do that. Take like a solid piece of metal and try to compress it you're not going to be able to do it. You can say, well, I can compress something like wood, but what are you really compressing? Air pockets and cell pockets and you know, things like that. But you're not actually compressing the solid. So anything that, that's, that's a solid, you're not going to actually be able to compress. Same thing with liquids. If you try to take water and you try to compress it down, you might be able to get a little tiny bit um, if you have really good measurements, but nothing perceptible. Now, can you take a gas and compress it? Sure, that's what all these sorts of containers always are, right? They just take a ton and ton of gas and they put it all into a little container so that then you can, you know, fill up balloons all day at a party with just one little container. Now, they also don't have a defined shape, which of course both liquids and um, liquids and gases and if you believe the internet cats all have. So, some of you have seen that meme. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so they, you know, they fill the shape of whatever you put them in. If I put them in, in some odd shaped container, they're just gonna fill it up, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. A solid doesn't do that, of course, right? You put a solid into you know, a container, it's just gonna sit there in the same shape it always was. They also are going to expand. Now this is different than a liquid, right? If you put a liquid in a container this, you know, this big, and then you give it a container this big, the only thing it's gonna do is flatten itself out. It's not going to get bigger where a gas is. A gas is gonna expand to fill whatever, you, whatever space you give it, it's gonna fill. They're gonna mix evenly amongst each other. So sometimes liquids will do this, sometimes they won't. It depends, um, you'll learn about that in, I think, 1B. Um, but in this case, gases are gonna mix. They're lower density, so that, that sort of makes sense, right? Like they weigh less for a given volume because they're not as closely packed. They're not all on top of each other. So those are sort of your general guidelines for what a gas are. That's how we define a gas. Um, I'm just, I'll give you a few more minutes to write down. All of these are things that I think on some level you probably know, but now they're sort of written out and defined so I could ask you, you know, how do you know if something is a gas? And you could say, well, I can compress it, it takes the shape of its surroundings, it'll mix evenly with each other, things of that sort. Okay, so now a little bit of a word on units because it's one of those you know, things of life. Um, I'm not gonna go through unit conversion with you. I don't think you would have made it past the first midterm if you didn't know how to do unit conversion. So I'll, I, but I do wanna talk about the units. So we have something called a Pascal, which is a Newton meter. So you're gonna, the gases really, really don't have a unit that pretty much is always used. Like, the, it's really sort of scattered is how people report it. So make sure you do know the other units. You, of course, you'll have the same equation sheet for your final that you had for your midterm in, in midterm two. So you'll know that you have these um, given to you. You'll also see kilopascal written a lot just because kilopascal gets you closer to an ATM. Um, what is approximate atmospheric pressure? About one, right? So that's where this comes in. Um, but a lot of times you see it measured in millimeters of mercury. Why millimeters of mercury? I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> oh, actually, I'll show you right now. Barometers. Okay, I hear lots of people whispering, go back. So I'll go back a sec. Um, so just know how to convert back and forth between these. You're gonna do it a lot and you wanna be able to do it really quickly just because it's, it's given you, when we do the ideal gas law, there's gonna be a lot of times that you have to do it in atmospheres. There's gonna be a lot of times that you don't and you wanna watch out for those because you don't wanna waste a lot of time converting units when you don't have to. Um, but you wanna be careful to make sure you always convert them when you do. And when we get to those sorts of problems, I'll go over it in more detail. Okay, so now why the millimeters of mercury thing came about. Something called a barometer, which you've probably seen somewhere um, in an antique store or something. But the idea behind barometers is they give you a measure of atmospheric pressure. So you can't really see what's happening in something like this. This is like an old, you know, something that you can make in a lab style barometer. So what you can do with this is you take and you put an empty tube in a thing of mercury, and then you put a little bit of room around the mercury so that the atmosphere can push down on it, okay? So the atmosphere is gonna be pushing down on this disc, of, or not disc, but um, liquid vat of mercury. When it does that, what happens if you push on a liquid and you have an empty tube in there? It goes up, right? So if it pushes on this, it's gonna push the mercury up into the tube. That's how a barometer actually works. So you have a vacuum tube, you have a dish of mercury, and then depending on how much atmospheric pressure we have, because it changes day to day, right? It changes with storms, it, it changes with um, a variety of different things. So this will give you a measure of that. Now, because this was how atmospheric pressure was originally measured, it ended up being measured in millimeters of mercury. Because you could just measure, you could just measure how much mercury was going up into the tube. And then you could sit in with your, your ruler and say, okay, well, the atmospheric pressure today is about 764 millimeters of mercury, okay? So that's how the millimeters of mercury unit came about. Now, maybe a good question at this point becomes, okay, mercury, why did we use mercury? What's special about mercury? It's a liquid, and it's, it's a liquid, right? And 
Why maybe not water? What, what else is special about mercury? It's really heavy. Or so I guess we should say dense, right? A small amount of mercury is going to weigh a lot more than a small amount of water. So this height is going to be dependent on how heavy it is, right? Because all of this right here, that's being pulled down too, right? It's being pushed up by the atmospheric pressure pushing into the tube. What is it being pulled down by? I guess maybe pulled is the better term here. Gravity. So the heavier it is, the more dense that it is, the more dense that this liquid is, the smaller it's going to be. Now, why would we want something to be small? Well, let's talk about it. Let's do an example. OK, so suppose we were marooned on a tropical island, and we wanted to know the atmospheric pressure, because it's really important information to know when you're marooned on a tropical island. It could be storms, right? You need to know if a storm's coming. OK, so how do we do this? Well, you have to know first that the density and the height are going to be proportional to each other. So we can set up this. Now, this looks pretty similar to like an M1V1 equals M2V2 problem, right? It's the same sort of idea. It's a ratio. Now, we have the density of seawater because that's theoretically what you have around. We have the height that it would reach in a mercury thermometer. Um, so let's try to figure this out. Well, let's set this up to be seawater. And this up to be what a mercury barometer would be. And fill in all our numbers and see what happens. So our density of water, seawater here, is 1.0, or excuse me, 1.10. And we don't know what our height of seawater is, so we'll just leave that as h, our height of seawater. And then we know what our density of mercury is, so we'll fill that in. And we know our mercury barometer reach. We don't have to worry too much about our units here for the same reason we don't have to worry about it in M1V1 equals M2V2, or if you, you haven't seen that recently, sometimes they do C1V1 equals C2V2, because it's a ratio. The units are, will all cancel out. So we're left with the height of the seawater. And we end up with 908 centimeters. So it's pretty big, right? So why wouldn't we want to use a water barometer in our houses? Because if you, you know, likely if you've problems here. I'll go back in a sec. Likely if you've um, seen these anywhere, it was probably at like maybe your grandma's house or something where they used to, you know, it would be next to a thermometer, things of that. You want to know the thermometer, the atmospheric pressure. So why, why not a water? Why wouldn't we want to use water for it? Yeah, who wants to have a, a thermometer that's like that big sitting around, right? So it's, it's a density height thing. We can use mercury because it's so dense that it doesn't take up a lot of height. And so that was why it was picked. Um, why don't we tend to have them sitting around our house now? Turns out mercury is kind of toxic. <laughs> so, um, same reason that we don't really have mercury thermometers anymore. Okay. All right. So now sort of moving on to a little bit of definition things that we'll need to know for the chapter. What is an ideal gas? So we talked about what a gas is, but what is an ideal gas? This is sort of a definition that we've made up in order to be able to do a bunch of calculations and is a relatively good approximation for some of the gases. Sometimes it breaks down and we'll talk about those examples, but for a lot of the gases, the ideal gas, or calling it an ideal gas or approximating it using the ideal gas is pretty close. 
So if you have an ideal gas or something that acts like an ideal gas, the molecules are going to move completely randomly. So that means they don't interact. So if you have two molecules and they come close to each other, if they're ideal gases or they're acting like ideal gases, they're not going to have much interaction with each other. They're just going to kind of whip by each other and keep going. They have no volume. So now if you think about an atom, we can agree that the atom has volume, right? Well, for the sake of ideal gases, we're going to pretend that's not a thing, that they don't have volume. And of course, this is sometimes more true than others, right? Something like helium is going to be a lot smaller than something like nitrogen. So you would expect helium to be a bit more ideal than nitrogen. But it's a good approximation. All collisions are elastic. What does elastic collision mean? It means they don't lose any energy. So the sort of technical term here is that they don't, there's, there's a complete conservation of energy. So if two things bounce into each other with a certain amount of energy, they're going to fly off with the exact same amount of energy. Now, maybe one that was going slower is now going to move faster, or one that was moving faster is now going to move slower. You can kind of think of it like billiard balls, only, of course, with, that, with pool balls, it's, um, it eventually stops because of friction, and it's not completely elastic. But it's, it's a good kind of visual, if it helps. So, a lot of your gases are going to be able to be treated as ideal, and then a lot of the gases are only going to be able to be treated as ideal in certain situations. So it's going to work really well at low pressures, and it's going to work really well at high temperatures. So let's think about why that is, because this is hard to remember if you don't, if you don't think about why it is, it's, and, I, and I'd rather you understand it than memorize it. Um, low pressures. So at low pressures, is the space between two molecules going to be high or really small? It's going to be really at, at low pressure. It's going to be really high, right? At low pressure, you're giving them lots and lots of room to move around. So you know, let's say we take out all the seats here. We, we don't want you guys to be a solid anymore. We take out all the seats, and I have all of you in here. That's pretty high pressure, right? We'll, we'll pretend some of you guys are in like competing sororities and fraternities too. It's a lot of pressure. Now I take three quarters of you and I say, okay, go away. We've lowered the pressure now, right? So is there going to be more room between those people or less room? More room. So are they going to interact as much? No, they're not going to interact as much. And it's because they're going to be more spaced out. We'll, we'll give them blindfolds and tell them to wander aimlessly. So they're, they're not going to interact. And so because of that, they're going to be more ideal. They're going to be more like an ideal gas. Now, if instead we just put tons and tons and tons of people in here and our pressure goes up, that's like mimicking our pressure going up, now they're going to interact a lot. Well, that means that they're not acting like an ideal gas, okay? So this one has to do with how much you're going to be interacting with each other. Um, high temperatures, we may have to leave that one a little bit toward the end, but I'm going to go ahead and explain it here anyways. So, at high temperatures, does anyone remember, know, what do molecules do at high temperatures? Are they faster or slower? Faster. You do all remember, yay. Okay, faster. So if now they're really, really fast and they're bumping into things, their collisions are, or let's actually reverse that, at low temperatures. So at low temperatures, they're going to be doing what? Going really, really slow. Now let's say that, you know, some of these people are friends and they're talking to each other. If I tell them they all have to run around really, really fast or they have to run around really, really slow, where are they going to be able to talk to their friends more? And they're going slow, right? If two people are just kind of walking by each other, okay, well, they can talk, they can talk, they can talk. If they're racing by each other, they're not going to be talking much, okay? So this has to do with how much you can interact to. If they're going slower, if there's an attraction between two molecules, they're going to be able to interact a little bit more. So all of this is how do we minimize interactions? Okay, so let's do some talking about what's going to happen if we change different components of a system. So there's, I think I've shown you one of these before. There's a great website. And there's a lot of these on here. If you're someone who really likes learning by like playing around with things, go visit this website and just you know play. It's fun. Um, so I've shown you this, I think, with the photoelectric effect. I think it was the last time I showed this to you. So let's say we have a container. And we have lots of different things we can change. We can change temperature. We can change the amount of gas we have. We can change 
volume, we can change all sorts of things. We can change even the size of the species. So let's put, say we put some gas in here. That was maybe a little more than I wanted. Luckily, we can let it go too. Okay, so we have some gas in here. Now, let's, let's kind of base this all on what's gonna happen to the pressure if we change different things. So let's say we make the volume smaller. What do you think is gonna happen to the pressure? It's gonna get bigger. And we can see this here. Definitely gets bigger, right? Now, what do you think, so let's move this back out. What do you think would happen based on what we just talked about on the last slide? If we increase temperature, what happens to the speed of molecules? It's faster. And so what do we think that's gonna do to the pressure? It's gonna go up, right? They're, all, all, they're gonna all have a little bit more energy. So we can do this, we can raise the temperature, we watch the thermometer climb, we can watch the pressure climb. Okay, I'll stop it now or it'll burst. I'll put some ice on it. Okay, so if we decrease volume, what happened to our pressure? It, it went up, right? Because we were squishing the molecules together. We increased our temperature, what happened to our pressure? It went up because uh, now they're moving around faster. Now, what happens if we just add more molecules? What's gonna happen to our pressure? It's gonna go up too. And it may burst. Okay, so those are sort of the things we're gonna go through and talk about in a little bit more detail now. But most of you were able to pretty much guess what was gonna happen before it happened, right? So that's good, you already know some of this stuff. So when we put it into equation form, that's really all we're doing. We're just taking what you already kind of know and we're putting it into equation form. Go and play around with this a little bit though, it is kind of fun. Okay. Now, all of these that I'm gonna be talking about have names associated with them. Um, perhaps I should care more that you can associate the name with the equation, but I, I don't. Um, I want you to know the equation, I want you to be able to use it, I want you to be able to make graphs of them, and I want you to be able to explain them. I, in four years from now, if I see you walking down the street and I say, hey, Boyle's Law, go. I want you to be able to say it has something to do with gases, and then give me a lecture on gases. Okay, maybe the last one was a little, you know, a little optimistic, but hey. I want you to know that I have something to do with gases. Like, I, you know, I should be able to ask you to list the, you know, list the different gas laws, and you can list the names, but if you can't associate them, I, I don't necessarily care too much. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about though is Boyle's Law. Now, you're also gonna notice, you know, normally I intersperse examples. I'm gonna wait to do examples until the end because you can do all of these using the very end combined law. And so I think that's almost a little bit better to teach you than using individual laws. So I'm gonna hold all examples until the end of this section. Okay, so Boyle's Law, we have pressure and volume. So this was, you know, equivalent to me squishing the box a little bit. If you increase the volume, pressure decreases. So we sort of did this in the opposite manner, right? We had this box with all the molecules floating around and then we took and we made the box smaller. And when we made the box smaller, what happened to the pressure? It increased, because you, you were squishing all the molecules together, right? It's like now I put everybody you know, free wandering around with blindfolds and your plugs in their you know, ears and you're wandering around in the room and now I start bringing the walls in, right? That's gonna increase the pressure. Everyone's gonna be a little bit more squished. They're gonna be running into the walls more. That's increasing pressure. So this just states the reverse. If you increase the volume, now the walls would be expanding out and everyone can move around a little bit more. Everyone's hitting the walls a little less. That's decreasing the pressure. Now, this is true when you have gas and temperature held constant. For all of these laws, in order to sort of define, like say, when you do this, this happens, we have to hold everything else constant. Otherwise, whatever's changing there could change some things. So in this case, this is true if you hold moles of gas and temperature constant. So now with all of these, we wanna see what the graphs look like. And we wanna see sort of if, what would happen as we decrease temp, or excuse me, as we decrease volume, what would happen to pressure? 
So we'll look at that in a minute. So here we have pressure versus volume and pressure versus one over volume. So you have this sort of decay here, this one over, one over x shape, if you remember back to your algebra two days where you had to recognize shapes of graphs. And this is because as your volume increases, your pressure decreases. Now, it's a little bit easier to see if we actually graph this in a linear fashion. If we say, okay, well, we have pressure here, we have volume here, or one over volume here, and we can make a linear graph this way. Um, from an experimental standpoint, a lab standpoint, this is a much easier graph to work with. Why? Well, we can come up with the equation for this line, and then we could say, well, for this system at any given volume, what's the pressure? And you could just find it. So these are the sorts of graphs I want you to know how to recognize, see, sketch, things of that sort. Okay. So our next one now that we're going to talk about is relating volume and temperature. So this comes into play in lots of different places um, where you have cold weather, actually. So occasionally you'll see this also called Gay-Lussac's law. Um, it's, you can kind of interchange the two. So this one says as volume increases, temperature increases. And as volume decreases, temperature decreases. So you can see this one fairly easily in real life. Has anyone ever stuck a balloon in the freezer? Okay, maybe that's not the most normal thing to do as a kid, but you know, I like chemistry. We don't have time to deal with freezers here today though. So we're just gonna use liquid nitrogen. So I don't think I've ever brought liquid nitrogen to this class. So what liquid nitrogen is, is exactly what it says. But liquid nitrogen is very, very cold. And so you have to get it very, very cold in order to make it liquid. So now we've made our balloon cold and it shrunk. And now it's warming up, so it's getting bigger. It's also very, very cold still. I maybe overdid, oh no, there it goes. I thought I might have overdone the coldness, but. And then if we let it sit for long enough, it'll go back to its original shape, assuming the, the rubber didn't do anything bad, but it's, it's fine. And you can just do it over and over again, right? It's not like we lost molecules. This is my, you know, you saw me stick it in, you saw me pull it back out. I didn't, you know, magically switch balloons or anything like that. I can have someone come up and check to make sure, you know, I'm not doing a magic trick here. Um, mostly I have no motivation to lie to you, so. So this is how you can remember this one, right? You stick a balloon in the freezer, or you're impatient like I am, and you stick it in liquid nitrogen. It shrinks. And I can only make it so small because the, this isn't a perfect system, and so the balloon, I'm worried about it breaking. But, and as it heats up, it gets bigger. And again, why is this? What's happening to the molecules as we heat them up? Yeah, the temperature, or the, the speed is increasing. So as you increase the temperature, you increase the speed, and it makes more pressure, or more volume, excuse me. So we're assuming that this, this is a model to say it's basically um, constant pressure, because remember, we have to keep the other things constant, right? So what is about the general pressure of this? Atmospheric pressure, right? So a balloon works good for a constant pressure situation because you can say, well, okay, it's basically atmospheric pressure. Sure, the rubber um, is gonna make a little bit of a difference, but for the most part, it's just kind of atmospheric. Okay, so places that this comes into um, play in sort of real life. Um, it's not quite as big of an issue here because you don't have a lot of um, weather. But if you live someplace like Alaska and you fill your tires in the middle of winter when it's like negative 20 degrees and then summertime comes, what happens to your tires? Yeah, the pressure or the volume is gonna try to expand. And again, this isn't, real life doesn't tend to be a great model for these things individually because of um, it's hard to hold this constant, but eventually you'll increase your pressure so much that your volume can't increase and it'll blow. Um, this is the little bit better um, way of modeling it. Has anyone ever gone camping and slept on an air mattress? Yeah. Well, either the rest of you are hardcore campers or you should try it sometime, it's fun. Um, I like air mattresses when I camp because you know the ground's hard. So what happens is, is if you fill it in the middle of the day, especially in the summer, 
it, you know, you fill it up, you're ready to go to bed, you go to bed, and then you wake up at 2 a.m. on the ground. And um, while this has happened because there's a hole in the air mattress, a lot of times it's really just because it got cold. So now you're cold and sleeping on the ground. <laughs> That's when camping becomes not quite as much fun. So the, the lesson to be learned here is you set up your tent first, and then you don't set up the air mattress until it's already started dropping in temperature. Okay. Also the you know, actual important lesson, that volume and temperature are proportional, that's good to learn too. <laughs> okay, so this is that same picture that was up for the other one. Um, this, you guys have a similar picture in your book. This one comes from the Chang book that we used in previous years. So this just kind of goes through and shows you the exact same idea. That if you're holding moles, R, which we haven't really talked about yet, and we'll just call that a constant, and then pressure constant, what's gonna happen as you change the temperatures? And then um, the reverse of that too, which is pressure, which we sort of talked about with the tires, right? If you increase temperature, what do you think is gonna happen to pressure if the volume isn't changing much? That's gonna increase too. So the pressure and volume are, are kind of closely related in this one in the sense that it's, in real life examples, it's hard to actually hold them both constant, or one of them const completely constant. So keep this in mind when you're looking at things. If you increase the temperature, you're going to either increase the pressure or the volume, assuming everything else is held constant. So let's look at a graph of this. Uh, I heard it go back, so we'll look at this one more time. Um, so yep, as you raise temperature, you can increase your volume. Or if you're holding your volume constant, if you're refusing to let this move, you can increase your pressure. If you lower your temperature, you're decreasing your volume. Or if you're holding your volume constant and instead allowing the pressure to change, your pressure is gonna decrease. Okay, so very similar. Okay, so now let's look at a graph of this one. Now, this would be the same if we put volume over here. It wouldn't, or excuse me, pressure over here. Whether we hold volume constant or whether we hold pressure constant, it turns out to be the same graph. And these are linear. Okay, so if you know how much, for an ideal gas, you know how much you're increasing the temperature by, you know how much you're increasing the volume by, and you know, vice versa. Okay, now let's look at this one. This one's a little bit more complicated, right? So now we have four different lines, and what's the big difference here? Yeah, your pressures, right? So this is, a, this is an ideal graph, or an ideal gas graph of Charles' law, but at different pressures. Because what do we know? We know pressure affects this, right? What does pressure do to volume? If you increase the pressure, it increases the volume too. So what happens here is that if you take this, it changes what's happening here. So this just shows you for all different pressures what's happening to your volume. Okay? So if you had four atmospheres, you would have it here, two here, one here, 0.5 here. All right. So that's all that graph is going through. Okay, next one, Avogadro's law. So what is Avogadro sort of known for? Avogadro's number, which has to do with what? Number of atoms, right? Number of atoms in a mole. So what do we think this one's gonna have to do with? Moles. So let's say we have a balloon. <coughs> Maybe. All right, we have a balloon. So we can make it bigger a couple different ways. You already talked about one, right? Changing the temperature. So I could put this in some place warmer. What's an easier way for our setup at the moment? Yeah. Okay, it's bigger now. So what does that mean? What did I do to make it larger? Awesome, I increased the number of moles. I made it bigger by putting more molecules in it, right? So this one says that volume and temperature, and you know, similarly volume and pressure, are gonna be related to each other, and that they're gonna be proportional, right? The more moles I put in, the, more, the larger the balloon gets. And again, this kind of, you can kind of model this as a, a constant volume system. So this one relates moles and volume. As your number of moles increases, so does your, number, or so does your volume. So if I wanna make this smaller, what do I do? Now it's really small, but I could have just let it go a little bit. It kind of slipped. <laughs> All right, 
So this is true when your pressure, tr pressure and your temperature is held constant, right? Because if I had changed my temperature a bit, then all sorts of other things are happening that we have to calculate in. So for all of these, we're talking about a couple of different, we're only relating two variables at once. If you bring in a third or a fourth variable, you can't necessarily say this. Sure, if you, you know, increase the number of moles, that's going to add to making it larger, but what if I then make it really cold? What's gonna happen? Well, it depends on, on the ratio, right? It depends on how much extra I put in versus how the cold is making it happen. Okay, so all of these then involve graphs, right? We have to be able to graph all of these in sort of a similar fashion to each other. Where this one would, I didn't graph this one, this one would just be linear again. It would look the same as the Charles Law graph. So we have two people talking and you know, I don't know if you've ever read XKCD. If you're in the sciences and maths, you really probably should um, as just part of life. So we have two of them, you can, this guy and girl, I think we should give it another shot. She says, we, we should break up and I can prove it. She grasps this, our relationship, and has obviously been going downhill. And he says, huh, maybe you're right. She says, I knew data would convince you. No, I just think I can do better than someone who doesn't label our axes. <laughs> it's kind of classic XKCD humor. Um, don't forget to label your axes, right? If I tell you to graph something, if I tell you to gas, graph pressure versus volume, and you don't put pressure and volume, maybe I thought you had it flip-flopped. Maybe I thought temperature was down here and pressure was up here. So make sure when, if I ask you to draw these graphs, you label your axes properly, okay? Um, you need to make sure that you put temperature and pressure, or temperature and volume, or whatever it is that I'm asking for. Otherwise, I won't know that you actually knew to put one of them on the bottom and one of them on the top, or whichever. Okay. So, now if we come back here a minute. Now we could actually go through and calculate all this if we wanted. Um, We could actually go through and say, change the temperature by a set amount and calculate the new pressure. We could say, okay, well, we want this to be exactly 600 and see what would happen. And um, we could say, okay, well, we know how many molecules are in here and we could put exactly double in and we could calculate the difference. We could do all three, right? We haven't really talked about how to do that in detail, but we could. We could say that, okay, well, I'm gonna increase the pressure by adding more gases. But then let's say I want to offset that. How would I offset that using temperature? Make it colder. Make it colder. So I could remove heat by doing this. And you could get it to go back to the exact same pressure. And we, um, we kind of guessed all this ahead of time. You guys are really good about guessing it all ahead of time, so I won't walk through it in too much detail again. But um, you, know, you can walk through there if you didn't quite guess it ahead of time and play around with it a bit. Okay. Now though, we're gonna take in the last few minutes and we're gonna take all of what we just learned and we're gonna combine it together. And then we're gonna do a bunch of examples. I just, it's, to me, you can do all of the examples from the ideal gas law and something we're gonna drive off the ideal gas law, so I think it's a little bit better to teach it after we've learned everything. Okay, so this is gonna be a combination of all of the things that we've learned. So up until now, we've said you can relate two of them at a time, and as one increases, the other one decreases, and it's proportional or inversely proportional, right? We, um, but we haven't really talked about what happens if we wanna change lots of things. What happens if I want to add more moles, but then I wanna cool it down? Or I want to you know, increase the pressure, but also increase the volume. And the ideal gas law will allow us to do this. So what this is basically doing is putting all of, the, all of the things together into one form of the equation. Now there's this R that we've sort of shown up in some of our figures that we've been talking about and we haven't really talked about. This is called the ideal gas constant. And it's just a constant that relates all of these together. So if you take all of the equations and you combine them, you get this. And if you go through and you know, cancel everything out, you could go through and say, well, now I can see that pressure is equal to one over volume if all of these are held constant. Or volume is proportional to temperature if, I can, if pressure moles, and of course R is always a constant, are held constant. 
This incorporates everything that we've just talked about into one equation, which is really nice. This is what R is equal to. Um, you may have R memorized slightly differently. Anyone else have it memorized as something different? 8.31, does that sound familiar? That one has joules in it. So that's also R. But that one, is, that one has to do with energy. So as far as which one to use, because you'll have both of them on the exam, how do you know in this one to pick this? Do you memorize it? No. Yeah, no is usually a good answer to that when it comes to me. How do you know? Let's look at this a second. Well, what is pressure in? Atmospheres. What is volume in? So SI unit for volume? Liters. Um, what about temperature? Kelvin. So are you going to want to use something that looks like this for units? Are you going to want to use something that has an energy unit in it? Yeah, this doesn't have any sort of energy going on. So we're going to use this one. Later on in the chapter, when we get into kinetic molecular theory, then we'll start using the energy. Um, we kind of already did that. So we just make, and this is actually kind of is what comes off this. Now, as we go on to problems, there's going to be ones where you have to really worry about units, and there's going to be ones where you don't really have to worry about units. If you need to worry about them, use the ideal gas constant, and I have the units written on the exam to help you remember what to use, right? It's got to be liters, it's got to be atmospheres, and it's got to be Kelvin. Always, 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 even on the ones where I tell you you don't have to worry about switching units around too much, temperature has to be in Kelvin, okay? If you see a temperature written down in Celsius, just put plus 273 next to it. Like you're reading through a problem and you see, okay, 62.4 written down, write a little plus 273 there, so that when you fill it into equation, you don't forget to do it. Um, when these get kind of long, I'll, I'll start listing out what we know and what we're trying to figure out. Just put two set plus 273 next to every single temperature that's listed in Celsius so you don't forget. It's one of the most commonly missed things on an exam. And on a short answer question, that's all your points, right? So don't, just be really careful about that. Okay, let's do one of these. So we have a general idea of what happens when we change things. But now we can also calculate the results of one thing based on all the other things that we measure. So if we have this, sulfur hexafluoride is a colorless, odorless, very unreactive gas. Calculate the pressure exerted by 1.82 moles in a steel vessel of volume 5.43 at 69.5 degrees C. Okay, so if we look at our PV equals NRT, Let's just write in a plus 273 here so that we don't forget. And what do we want to solve for? Well, we're looking for pressure. So we're not changing anything here. We're not going from one set to another set. So we can just solve for pressure. Okay. Now we can just fill everything in, making sure all of our units are okay. So we have 1.82 moles. We fill in R, making sure to fill in the right one. And we can fill in temperature. I'll admit, I normally fill it into my calculator just like this. Um, if you do that, you have to watch out for parentheses, though. It may not be a bad idea to fill in the you know, added number here and do it in one step or two steps. And then we solve, and we get this. OK. So that's how you do an ideal gas law that doesn't um, change around, that, where you're not changing things. You're not going back and forth. OK. So let's see. We have two minutes. So see if you can do this in two minutes, and I'll give you the answer. You guys see if you can beat me to it. You're going to do it exactly the same, only you're solving for what now? Volume. I 
I would suggest rearranging the equation first. Usually for these, that's your best bet, especially when they get harder. Okay. Down to one minute, so I'll get you started on the equation. Looks like you're on the calculator point, so I'll fill some things in for you. All right, do we have answers? What do we think? Do it price is right style. What's the first digit? You get 9.28 liters. Okay. So that's how you go about doing those. Next time what we'll do is we'll show you ways to calculate when things are changing. So when we're going from one thing and then one set of conditions, we change the set of conditions and what we get for that.